Hi guys, I hope you are doing well. Uh, welcome to this uh, strategic business reporting orientation session. Uh, before we go on uh, discussing about the strategic business reporting, let me introduce myself. My name is Lukman Rafiq. I've been in teaching profession for more than 13 years now. And uh, I've been teaching various qualifications, including the ACCA, the ICAW, which is the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales, the CIMA of a UK, and the Local Chartered Accountancy Qualification of Pakistan, which is the ICAP qualification. I've been teaching various subjects, including the financial reporting, financial management, auditing, and performance management. These have been the various subjects that I've been teaching. I've conducted the global webinars for ACC on several occasions and the various subjects on which uh, I've conducted the webinars that include the reporting, that include auditing, that include performance management and the financial management. <clears throat> I've also conducted the training sessions for SIMA for training the uh, professors at various universities about how to teach the new updates, new methodologies in the performance management. I have also conducted the financial reporting uh, sessions for the ICAP uh, uh, for the CA final preparations. So that is what my profile is. Now, so uh, the agenda for today's session is that we will be going through the strategic business reporting. We would be having an overview of the syllabus of the strategic business reporting. And the next thing that I would be doing in today's session also is that I would take you through one of the past examination questions of the SBR and uh, why am I going to take you through that past examination questions because a lot of the students they don't actually uh, differentiate between the financial reporting F7 paper and the SBR paper. So my objective of actually taking you through that uh, question is that I want to tell you that where exactly is the examiner differentiating between the F7 paper and the SBR paper. So starting off with the SBR uh, this paper was previously known as this paper was previously known as paper P2 so a lot of the students what they do is that they prepare the paper P2 and they think that they have had enough practice and they can go about doing the SBR so let me tell you the P2 paper was actually the corporate reporting the P2 paper was the corporate reporting what is this corporate reporting it was how the corporates report but now the paper has become SBR, which is a strategic business reporting. What do we mean by this? This means strategically how a business would report. So when it comes to strategically business reporting, it's not just re related to the financial reporting. It's about the other reporting also. And as we progress, as we move ahead with the slavers discussion, so you would see that there are many things other than the financial statements that this paper SBR actually discusses. So. Let's move a bit forward. Let's have a discussion about it. Uh, I have opened in front of you the latest syllabus of the SBR. And what I would do is that I would first of all go to the relational diagram of this, this specific paper SBR, which actually links up, which actually shows what papers or what prior knowledge that is required for you to be able to attempt the SBR. Now, the first thing that I want to actually discuss is that you could see that there is a connection, there is a relationship diagram where you've got this paper which is uh, the financial accounting paper also known as F3. Then you've got the financial reporting paper also known as F7 and here you've got this P2 paper and they've got another connection with the P7 paper which I'm not going to be discussing right now. Uh, but I could just give you a brief guidance over here for those of you who wish to appear in the AAA paper it is recommended that you attempt AAA after you have studied SBR or you attempt AAA along with SBR. So that's what you should do. You should not attempt AAA before doing SBR. Anyways, coming back to it. So now a very important aspect is this F7. <clears throat> this happens with a lot of us. The moment we come out of the examination hall, I repeat, the moment we come out of the examination hall, the first thing that happens is that we forget everything that we had studied for the exam. We forget everything that we have studied for the exam even if our preparations were good or even if our preparations were not good. So 
when it comes to the SBR level, let me guide you. There is approximately 25% of the paper which is based upon the areas that you have studied at the F7 level. So it is important that you should know what you have studied at F7. You should be able to apply those to the different scenarios and then you will be able to succeed. Otherwise, you won't be able to succeed. So it's important that you should know the F7 level knowledge. Now, how are we going to tackle this problem? Because I know this thing that you have forgotten everything. So the way we are going to tackle it is that what I'll be doing is that uh, I'll be covering each and every accounting standard that you have covered up at the F7 level. Obviously, the coverage would not be at a very slow pace, would be at a slightly faster pace because my objective is to revise, is not to teach you from the scratch, but I would be doing <clears throat> <clears throat> I would be doing revision of every single accounting standard, every single thing that you have studied at the F7 level and we would be doing the SBR level examination questions pertaining to those topics which you have studied at F7. So the way we are going to be preparing it is that we will be, we'll be covering, we'll be focusing on them also. Now, the next thing which is there in the syllabus also is the approach to examining the syllabus. Um, the SBR level pa SBR paper is examined a bit differently to the other uh, strategic uh, professional examinations. That is, uh, when you come to section A, there are two questions in section A and those two questions are actually structured like this. Those two questions are structured like this that you would have one of the questions of 30 marks and one of the question for 20 marks. And then you've got section B, which is again two questions of 25 marks each. So that makes it 50 mark here, 20 mark here, 30 mark here. So 50 and 50, that's how the 100 marks are made up of. But you've got what? You've got 50 mark in section A and you've got 50 marks in section B. Section A, you've got two questions. Whereas generally for the majority strategic professional exams, it's one, it's, it's actually one question. But here it's actually two questions. So that is what you would have to deal with. So that means you would have to deal with four questions. What do you have to deal with? You have to deal with four questions. So obviously time management is going to be an issue. It's going to be a time pressured paper. So you would have to manage your time. You would have to manage your time. That's an important thing. Now let's move a bit forward and let's talk about the syllabus areas. Uh, so if I could just take you through the syllabus areas. What I'll be doing is that I will also be discussing about the syllabus areas that what exactly is covered up in the syllabus. So that is also something that we would be doing. Now, see, these are basically the sections of the syllabus. These are actually the sections of the syllabus. What I would do is that I would discuss each one of them. I would discuss each one of them one by one. Now, first of all, this section, section G, the employability and the technology skills. What is this employability and the technology skill? If you go through any of the syllabus, starting from the applied skills paper of F5 up till the P7 level paper, you'd find this section to be included in every single paper. Now, what has ACCA done? Um, ACCA uh, as a mission to ensure that the employment of their students, employment of their graduates increase, what ACCA has done is ACCA has actually uh, made an aim that they would enhance the employability skills of their students. So how would they enhance the employment employability skills of their students? They want to make their students work ready. I repeat, they want to make their students work ready. Now what exactly do you mean by making their students work ready? So once you go into the office environment, uh, you got to learn a lot of things, especially the use of technology to process the information. Because you get ample amount of information, you get ample amount of data, ample amount of information, you got to analyze that information, you got to interpret that information and then what happens is that and that all is done using technology. I repeat, all of it is done using technology. Now a very important thing that you need to keep in mind is that when all of this is done using technology, so uh, ACCA wants the students to learn this uh, skill while they are preparing for ACCA. So once they go on to the office work, they don't have to learn this use of technology and integration of data into that. They are work ready and they can start working. Now, 
as a student a lot of the students get worried so what do we need to do for this you don't have to do anything all that you have to do is that you have to focus on the cbe practice platform the cbe practice platform of acca is sufficient enough for you to attain to acquire these employability and technology skills why because once you prepare for the cb practice platform you know how to practice you know how to use excel you know how to apply the data uh, how to analyze the data using technology you need you understand the skills of processing the data using the spreadsheets and etc so once you learn this so that means you are work ready to an extent and that is what acc is trying to do so you don't have to go any extra mile and to learn these things no it's just that if you are ready for the cb practice platform that is more than enough that is more than enough now so that is one of the aspects which technically is nothing the second aspect of the syllabus is um you could see the impact of changes in the accounting regulations the impact of changes in accounting regulations let me guide you about this changes in accounting regulation that what exactly do mean by this um you would know this thing that there is a body which is called iasb what is the name of the body the name of the body is iasb this is international accounting standards board and there is another body which is fasb what is iasb what is fasb let me give you a brief idea iasb is the international accounting standard boards which is actually the body which sets ifrs and the fasb is the body that sets the us generally accepted accounting principles i repeat fasb is one of those bodies that actually sets the us generally accepted accounting principles now over a period of time globalization has happened and it has now become very easy for somebody sitting in china to invest in us for somebody sitting in us to invest in malaysia to invest in india etc so what happens is there is cross border investment there is cross border investment uh, uh because uh, the countries they want foreigners to invest in their country now what used to happen was the accounting standards which were introduced by fasb they were very different to the accounting standard treatment by iasb in many aspects so as a result of this if i am an investor sitting in let's say a dubai and if i want to invest in uk so i've got a different set of accounting standards that are being followed by the entities if i want to invest in australia there is a different set of accounting standards are uh, being followed by the entities and if i want to invest in us which is one of the major capital markets so it becomes problematic situation for me to invest in us because i don't understand the financial statements how would i invest in us so in order to overcome this there was actually an arrangement between iasb and fasb and that arrangement was actually termed as convergence project now what was this convergence project this convergence project was that there was a discussion between them and they identified the areas where there were some areas where iasb treatment was superior there were some areas where the fasb treatment was superior so in few places the us accounting standard was adopted by iasb in some cases the ifrs was adopted by the fasb and in some cases in some cases there were updations that were done so that was actually part of the convergence project just to make sure that the globalization is supported so that the cross border investments are supported so this project went on and on and on now as a result of undertaking this project iasb the international accounting standard board has got a standard setting process it's not like this that they would sleep one night and they would issue an accounting standard the next day no the way it goes about is that they issue discussion paper they issue exposure draft and then it goes on to become an accounting standard and then it goes on to become an ifrs now what do we mean by this 
this would actually mean that the concept of discussion paper is that there is a point, there is an agenda that they identify that look these, 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 these areas need to be discussed. Let's say if they want to bring about an amendment in IAS 16 property plan and equipment, they would just list down several points. Okay, this, 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 this is the amendment that needs to be made. Now, what next is going to happen? They would publish a discussion paper, they would invite opinions, they would invite discussions from the general public, etc. On the basis of discussion paper, the International Accounting Standard Boards would sit down, the International Accounting Standard Body would sit down, they would discuss what are the things that need to be done, they would discuss that what are the amendments that are required to be made, etc, etc. So they would, they would actually, they would actually be discussing a lot of things. Now, as a result of this, what is going to happen is, let me guide you. Once they get through this discussion paper, they go on to the exposure draft publishing. What is this exposure draft? It's a draft that is published to the public and the public is invited to comment that, look, this is how we expect the accounting standard is going to look like. So now, the public comments and then after the public comments, the accounting standard body, it reviews that, okay, what have we done? Why, why is the public uh, criti criticizing us so much? Let's put it to the board. Let's bring about some amendments, etc. There is a lengthy process. You don't get an accounting standard to be set within one day. The accounting standard for financial instrument, which is IFRS 9, was published in stages and it took almost 10 years to change this from IS 39 to IFRS 9. Almost 10 years. Can you imagine 10 years? Now, so how is it relevant for us at SBR? Now, why am I actually discussing all these things? The reason being, I'm just trying to tell you there is an area in your syllabus and that area is termed as current issues. What is that area termed as? It is termed as current issues. And under this current issue, the examiner would identify in the syllabus, let's say this, 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 one, two, three, four, for example, four current issues. They would identify four current issues in the syllabus and what could happen is that they could give you scenarios in the exam with respect to those current issues. Generally speaking, it's around 10 mark area, 8 mark area, depending upon the examiner's mood. So it's, it's going to be something that would be examined and what are the things that they examine is that they would ask you what they would, they could ask you questions like this. What is the existing standards treatment? compared with the new treatment. They might ask you about the benefits. They might ask you the problems with existing treatment. They might even ask you to apply the new treatment. So as a student, what you got to do is that you got to make sure that when you are preparing for the SBR exam, you do cover them up. Now, a lot of students, what happens is that they get worried about current issues, current issues, current issues and and they don't, I mean like they, they, they panic a lot with the current issues. So first of all, you don't have to panic with the current issues. Um, I would recommend you people that when you go for the ACC approved content, so there is a content by BPP, there is a content by Kaplan. Kaplan, what it does is that, uh, I don't know how is it going to be in the next edition, which is the new edition. But up till now, what the Kaplan has been doing is, in the final chapter, the Kaplan gives you a current issues chapter, which, which is about all the current developments that are actually taking place. So it's one of the best reads. It's one of the best reads. And what I'll also be doing is, I will also be conducting lectures on the current issues. So you don't have to be worried about it that you might, uh, you might think that we will have to do current issues on our own. No, I'll be discussing them. I'll be explaining the current issues to you. I'll be guiding you through the whole current issues process. Okay, so that's one aspect. Now, so what I was trying to tell you people is that there is this thing which is impact of changes in accounting regulation. What is it? Impact of changes in accounting regulation. That is, there is a change in the accounting regulation. How exactly are you going to be dealing with that change? That is something that you should understand. Okay, the next thing is about the fundamental and the ethical and the professional principles, a very important aspect. You see, 
ACCA or it's not just ACCA, it's about every single professional body, whether that is be a body of engineers, whether that be a body of doctors, whether that be chart accountants, whether that be CFAs, whether that be anything else, whether that be lawyers, every, every single body nowadays is focusing upon teaching their graduates ethics. Every single body is now focusing upon teaching their graduates ethics. Now, you have already studied the code of ethics at the F8 level, which is the audit and assurance level, and you already know that there are few fundamental ethical principles like integrity, like uh, objectivity. Uh, you do know that there is this integrity, there is this objectivity. professional competence and due care etc 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 and you do know that there are different types of threats like self interest threat like self review threat etc etc so there are multiple types of things that you do know <clears throat> now do we need to do we need to explain to the examiner what a self review threat is or what a self interest threat is no you don't have to explain it but what is expected from you at this level is that the examiner is going to give you scenarios I repeat the examiner is going to give you scenarios where there are actually going to be the ethical issues that you will be facing as an accountant you will be facing the ethical issues as an accountant so what is it that you need to do you need to actually suggest that what are the ethical issues that are arising how you would deal with that issue and uh, what are the safeguards that you would exercise during uh, in order to deal with that issue so that is something that you would have to do so you could expect around seven to eight mark in the examination pertaining to ethics so like ethics and the current issue constitute around 15 to 20 mark of the paper and it's an important area it's not an area that you can leave now a lot of the students they get worried that how exactly are we going to deal with ethics because the tutors usually don't focus upon them so don't worry we'll be focusing upon them I'll be going through some past examination questions like around six to eight questions on the ethics and in those questions I will tell you I will guide you how the ethics are actually dealt with in the in the in the accounting situation in the accounting scenarios so you don't have to worry about it. We will have a real life exam practice about them. Don't worry about it. So that's the second thing with respect to it, which is the ethics. Now let's move a bit forward and let's talk further. Now you have got the other aspects of the syllabus, which is another aspect, which is the financial reporting framework. Even at the F7 level, you do have an area, which is the conceptual framework I repeat even at the F7 level you do have a topic which is called conceptual framework now what exactly is this conceptual framework let me guide you about it uh, at the F7 level the students they just don't focus much on the conceptual framework they do realize that this is hardly going to be examined as a two MCQ max at the max two MCQ so that's why the students they just simply ignore it and they're like we have got so many accounting standards to worry about already so what else are we going to talk about now let me guide you this is termed as IASB conceptual framework what is it termed as IASB conceptual framework what is this IASB conceptual framework? So you see, if you go to any country, I repeat, if you go to any country, there is going to be a constitution. There's going to be a constitution. What is this constitution? The constitution is the overall rules, the overall regulations, the constitution actually refers to the overall rules and regulations that that the lawmakers that the people living in this country are expected to comply with 
so whenever we draw up any law in a country you have to make sure that the law is in line with the constitution i repeat whenever any law is being made in a country you got to make sure that that law is actually in line with the constitution if there is a law if there is a law which is not made keeping in mind the constitution that law is termed as ultra vires ab initio i am sorry to be using some uh, uh, legal terminologies but you see you have already studied them ultra vires is basically illegal ab initio from the start ab initio ultra vires ab initio anyways coming back to it now let me try to explain to you when it comes to iasb conceptual framework this is exactly what the role of iasb's conceptual framework is that it acts as a constitution it acts as a constitution for the iasb for the accounting standard setters when they are going to be when they are going to be devising the ifrs when they are going to be publishing ifrs they need to make sure that this ifrs is in line with the conceptual framework now there is a problem the problem that arises is the accounting standards were developed earlier and the conceptual framework was developed later on the conceptual framework defines what an asset is the conceptual framework defines what a liability is the conceptual framework defines what an income is it defines what an expense is but the problem is there are few accounting standards which do define certain definitions of liabilities assets they do not match the definition of the conceptual frameworks assets or liabilities for example the deferred tax liability it does not meet the definition of liability yet it is recognized now why is that so because unfortunately the framework was developed later on the accounting standard was developed earlier so is the iasb doing something about it they are thinking of doing something they're not doing anything right now but what as a student you should know is that you should know that what does conceptual framework says you should know where the conceptual framework differs from the accounting standard you should know that what are the accounting standards which do not comply with the conceptual framework that is something that you should know and that is what is expected from you as a student while attempting this sbr paper also that you should know about the conceptual framework that what does it say what are the definitions if the examiner ask us to apply the conceptual framework to a given scenario how exactly are we going to do it you should know all this now let's move a bit forward okay um uh, please uh, don't take this whole lecture as a deterrent i'm just trying to elaborate that what are the components and what are the constituents of the syllabus so to me from the basis of my judgment 8 marks 8 marks ah uh, 4 marks so this is approximately 20 marks in total framework ethics and the current issues this is in total 20 marks and i personally think they are easy marks to get if you have prepared a bit of them if you prepared them well uh, and it is hardly going to take you i am giving you a guarantee it's hardly going to take you 4 hours to prepare them that's it 4 hours at the max and you get 20 marks but these 4 hours should be these 4 hours should be applied at the end of the course they should not be applied at the start of the course because once you are going to study all of these things you see you see these connections these connections these connects they are telling you that every single aspect of the paper is connected is connected to the other aspects so that means that for you to be able to apply current issues for you to be able to apply ethics in the given scenarios for you to be able to connect the conceptual framework you should study other areas of the syllabus and what are the other areas of the syllabus let's have a discussion on them so if i talk about these other three areas which are the three major areas of the syllabus uh, which is reporting of financial performance which is preparation of financials of group entities and which is interpreting financials for the other stakeholders 
So what exactly are these three areas? Let me guide you. Basically what happens is that if I talk about these three areas, let's just see. So one of them is about the reporting of this financial performance for the range of entities. You've got revenue means you will be discussing IFRS 15 at length. Believe me, you have only studied a very small portion of IFRS 15 at the F7 level. We will be studying a good in depth. We will be studying a good detail of IFRS 15 here. Then the non-current asset, all the accounting is standard including IAS 16, including IAS 23, including IAS 36, 38, 40, 41. All of these standards are going to be applicable here. The financial instrument, we have studied IAS 32, we have studied IFRS 9, but again we have studied them at a very small, 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 small depth. We will be studying in depth these financial instruments. Leases, you only study the accounting for lessee. You only study the accounting for lessee. Over here, we will be studying lessor's accounting also. We will be discussing about manufacturer, dealer, lessor. There are going to be sale and lease back transactions which are examinable at F7 also. But there are going to be more sale and lease back transactions that you would come across here. What next is their employee benefits? Whatever benefits that you give to your employee, the salaries, the pensions, the provident funds, the gratuities, the allowances, cars, houses, travels, whatsoever. We are going to discuss about the accounting under IS-19 here. The taxes, um, it's a full-fledged standard that's examinable here. Uh, it's very different to the way it was examined at the F7 level. Provisions contingent liabilities which is 37 and IS 10. Uh, it's more or less the knowledge that you studied F7 is sufficient enough but you got to uh, understand the application skills here. Share based payment. At times you enter into a transaction where you use your company's shares as a consideration. So when you enter into a transaction where you are using your company's shares as a consideration, so such a transaction is considered to be a share based payment transaction. So it's an IFRS 2 which we would be discussing and there is lastly IFRS 13 and also uh, uh, there is IFRS uh, 5, uh, sorry this uh, SME's accounting standards, there is a separate set of accounting standards for SME's and other reporting issues that we will be discussing. So I personally think that this is the core area along with this, the financials of group entities. You have studied a single subsidiary up till now. You have studied a single subsidiary up till now. You have only studied, you have only studied a single subsidiary up till now. You have only studied associate. Here you would talk about two subsidiaries, three subsidiaries. You would talk about the acquisitions in the group. What do you mean by acquisition? There's a 30% shareholding, it becomes 60%. There's a 60% shareholding, it becomes 90%. You'd be talking about the disposals. There'll be group disposals. You've got 90% shareholding, you go to zero. You've got a 90% shareholding, you go to 60%. You've got a 90% shareholding, you go to 40%. There are going to be disposals also. In addition to this, there is going to be the group cash flow. You have not studied them at F7. There are going to be the foreign subsidiaries also. There are going to be foreign subsidiaries. You are in UK, you want to invest in Australia. You are in UK, you want to invest in Gambia. You are in UK, you want to invest in Tanzania. You are in UK. You want to invest in Caribbeans. You will be. You'll be. You'll be. You'll be handling all these things. So there's going to be foreign investments, foreign currency transaction. That is all you would be dealing with. Next, the interpretation of financials for different stakeholders. A very important and interesting area. Uh, at the F7 level, we study ratio analysis. I repeat, at the F7 level, we study ratio analysis. The ratios are simply financial statement evaluation. But at this SBR level, 
it's an evaluation from the perspective of stakeholders what are the different types of stakeholders that you may have you may have lenders you may have potential investors you may have the existing shareholders your investors may be some financial institutions your investors may be some private equity firm there could be different type of investors and they could have a different type of requirement that is something that you are expected to handle in this scenario so there are going to be financial along with that non financial performance measurement that is also going to be part and parcel of the course so we'll be discussing them also with respect to the current issue that i've already discussed and with respect to employability and technology skills i've also discussed so see this section c section d and section e they in total constitutes around 75 to 80% of the course they constitute around 75 to 80% of the course so you as a student would have to keep in mind that you are prepared and you are ready for all this so i bet you as a student you have to be prepared that you are ready for all this now what is it that i need to do as a student so let me guide you a bit uh the way we teach the way i teach it's going to be like this once you enroll with us you would get access to the recorded lectures once you enroll with us you would get access to the recorded lectures and what would happen is from time to time from time to time from time to time uh we would have live classes which is going to be two classes a week two classes a week ideally they are going to be of two hours of duration what is going to be our agenda during those classes we would actually be i repeat we would actually be going ahead uh recalling an area <clears throat> which you have already studied on the portal on the portal through the recorded lectures and then what we would be doing is that we would have a quick recall of that and we would be practicing the past paper questions on those areas so like maybe if there are five past paper i may be going through two in the live classes three would be made available to you in the recorded format that's how things are going to be plus you would be added to the whatsapp group where you could communicate with me you would communicate with the other students also there's going to be a group for the registered students fourthly um from time to time you could submit some assignments for review which i am going to review i am going to give them back to you so that you have an idea what have you done right what have you done wrong the fifth one of them is going to be there is going to be a mock examination uh, <clears throat> in the last month around 10 days before the exam and the sixth one which is i think uh, is a very important area for you to actually pass which is going to be the revision uh, which is usually a 5 day revision in the last month before the exam so that is how we go about i bet that is how we go about <clears throat> so as a student do i need to study a lot for the sbr uh, well the syllabus is lengthy so do i need to study a lot yes you need to study but always remember that there is always a smart way of studying what is the smart way of studying if you are studying with a tutor you don't have to just go on and open up uh, the books and you go through each and every chapter of the books on your own that's going to take a lot of time a lot of students what they do is that they uh, do register for the course they get access to the lectures and again the way they start off is the books you don't have to do it this way no what do you need to do you need to go through the lecture sequence and you need to follow the tutor and once you are done with the tutors then you may go on and have a quick review of the book that's what you could do but if you start off with a book alongside being enrolled there is no point then you do self study no point in enrolling with us if you wish to enroll with us what is going to help you is to follow us to follow the guidance that we are providing 
so that is something that is going to help you so that's it from uh, my side with respect to the orientation for SBR and I think that you people would have got a very good insight about what 